Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, we're so thankful uh, that these are, though old and ancient words, uh, they're not dead. They're very, very, very true. Uh, they speak of a time gone by, and then they speak of what we are experiencing and going through today. And so, Holy Spirit, would you make this alive to us this morning? We want to see you for who you are. We're in desperate need of a Savior, and the text is going to show us this morning. Uh, but praise, praise God that you sent Jesus to come and live the life that we should have lived, died the death we all deserve, um, that he... Uh, is no longer in the tomb. The tomb is empty. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so, um, Jesus, we praise you. We thank you. And then, Lord, uh, help me. Help me to speak with conviction and with truth, uh, but with grace and love. Uh, help me to be clear. Uh, and so, Lord, I ask that the words that I have prepared, may they submit to your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that my heart would submit to your heart. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, at first, I had titled this message, The State of the Nation. And then I read, and then I read, and then I read, and then I quickly realized this is not the state of the nation, but rather, this is the state of God's people. That in these chapters, what we see is God saying, this is the state of my people. This is the state of my church. Particularly when the church no longer looks to God as king. You see, in the book of Judges, there's a phrase that keeps coming up, and it comes up quite a bit uh, towards the end of the book of Judges, is that in those days, Israel had no king, and everybody did what was right in their eyes. Basically, they did whatever they wanted. You see, that statement in many ways is untrue but true. In those days, Israel did have a king, God is their king. But what was happening is that they, they weren't looking to God as king. And so that's why the author of Judges says, well, it, it's as if they were living as if God was not seated on his throne. And they did whatever they wanted. And so in these last chapters, what we see is, is Israel, the people of God, because you'll see that, that there isn't any mention of foreign nations I've mentioned it over and over as we've walked through this series, that, they, that there was oppression from outside, but then I, what I would do is try to show you that even though there was a problem outside, there was also a problem inside. These last five chapters reveal to us the massive issues that happen inside, among the people of God, in the church when we take our eyes off God, when we no longer look to him as king, these are the things that happen. I have three points for you this morning, if you're taking notes. We're going to see three things. Three things, when we take our eyes off God, here's what happens. Number one, we redefine God. We redefine God. Number two, we worship idols. And then number three, we descend into chaos and anarchy. So let's jump straight in. Number one, we redefine God, and we do so to our specifications. God becomes a, a build a bear. I don't know if you've ever gone to those where you walk in. They're the worst places for kids. You walk in, and, and what they do is they give you all these different things, and they say, you can put together your own bear. When we take our eyes off God, this is how we treat him. We redefine God. You see, the opening scenes of chapter 17, verse 1, we find a hill, the hill country of Ephraim, a hill we have seen a few times in the book of Judges. Joshua was buried there in Joshua chapter 2. Ehud blew his trumpet there in Judges chapter 3. Deborah held court there in Judges chapter 4. Gideon sent messengers there to call the men of Ephraim to fight against the Midianites in Judges chapter 7. So it's a familiar hill. But now we find a man named Micah, together with his mom, who set up an idol shrine to worship. Let's start at the beginning. We're told that 1,100 pieces of silver are stolen from Micah's mom. She then pronounces a curse on whoever stole those pieces. It turns out that the thief 
was her very son. He hears the curse and then I guess gets scared and then goes and tells his mom that, no, it was me and I will return those silver pieces. Micah's mom hears this and then is very thankful. She then blesses Micah. I mean, already out the gates, we're like, this doesn't make any sense. No discipline, no, no words of how could you do such a thing. No, 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 no. She blesses Micah in the name of the Lord. Upon return of these silver pieces, Micah's mom dedicates this to the Lord and then requests that some of the money be made into a carved image and a silver idol. Then all of it is then given to Micah. She's basically saying, God, I'm going to say thank you that my son stole from me, then returned it because he heard the curse. And so we're going to create these idols to say thank you, God. If we read the text carefully, we would notice that she, she doesn't make a false God. The text doesn't say that. But rather a statue to Jehovah. To Israel's God. Verse 3 of chapter 17 says, He returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I personally consecrate the silver to the Lord for my son's benefit to make a carved image and a silver idol. Micah then makes some household gods and an ephod and puts them in the shrine. You see, in the process of all of this, Micah then decides to take his son and then make him a priest, a, a position that is only to be held by Levites. So, so, so uh, again, I'm just painting the picture. Money is stolen, a curse is given, money is returned. Instead of discipline, we go, we're going to bless the Lord by taking some of this money and carving it and shaping it into an idol and then giving everything to Micah. Micah then goes, this is great. Actually, let me add a few other gods to this, to the shrine that we have created in the name of the Lord. And then I'm going to appoint one of my sons to become a priest, a position only for Levites. Friends, all of this is very confusing and happens in the first few verses of Judges chapter 17. And then verse 6 says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. That's exactly what we're seeing. This is what we call individualism. On steroids. <laughs> I do whatever seems right to me, whatever makes me happy, whatever pleases me. And this includes redefining not just what the Bible says, but redefining the author of the Bible himself. What's happening here is a violation of the second commandment. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5, it says, You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I know some of us might think, but honor, this is not a random image. This, this is somewhat an image of the Lord. It's not a rabbit or a lion or a unicorn or whatever is trending at that time. It's an attempt to capture the Lord and then to honor him. Two problems with that train of thought and that practice. Number one, God said don't do it. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. But, but, but it's, it's in your name of any kind. God said, don't do it. And you would think that that would be enough. You, you would think, like, if God says, don't do this, then we don't do it. Yeah. If God says, do this, then we do it. But we all know that that is not the reality. 
even in our parenting and, and, and friends, I'm all in. I'm all in for explaining and making sure they understand and talking to your kids. I, I'm all, we do it at home. I'm all for it. But there are times where you, you look at your little one and you say, don't do this. And they go, but why? Because I said so. Because I am your parent. Because I love you. Because I know more than you. This is what God says to us. Don't do this. And you think, oh, I get it. But that is not the case. That's reason number one that this is a massive problem. Reason number two is that we can never really capture the image of God. Our minds cannot fully comprehend him. The awe and the wonder of God. It is too grand for the human mind to conceive. And so what ends up happening is we capture the parts that we like and we disregard the parts that we don't quite understand or make us feel uncomfortable. So we'll carve out his mercy, but not his justice. We will carve out his goodness, but not his power. We'll carve out his forgiveness, but not his holiness. And so now we're somewhat confused. It's like, I, I don't get it. And I think this is why you find churches that, that are heavy on the truth, but lack love. Heavy on his holiness, but don't quite understand forgiveness. Friends, this is why we need the church. This is why we need to be awakened to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. Because there are some folks who, who just think, like, we, I get the grace of God. I just do, I, I'm, I, I just get, it makes sense to me. And then there are some people who don't, who struggle with that. But maybe they understand something else, another aspect, another attribute of God. And so when we come together, we have this, this healthy kind of community and fellowship that's constantly pointing one another to the Father. See, this redefining of God is so dangerous because what then happens is we begin to redefine morality. What is right and what is wrong. Because now it's, it's all on you. And so what is right and wrong here is different to what is right and wrong here is different to what is right and wrong there. When you and I define God and morality as we prefer, we're not really submitting to God. We're just worshiping our preferences. We're not worshiping God. Let's be honest. We're not. It's about what I want and what makes me feel comfortable. It's about my feelings, and I'm all for feelings. They help us navigate life, but I say it all the time. They are horrible saviors. When we define God and morality, it's all about us now. What we end up having is a, a God of our, our own personal imagination instead of a God of scriptural revelation. We become the embodiment of everyone did whatever seemed right to him. And remember, I'm talking about the church. We, we can get into society and popular culture, and no, we can definitely talk about that, and I'm all in for that. But I'm giving you the state of the church. God has already defined himself, and he needs no help from us. Our role is to know him and to make him known. Yeah. That's it. It's to know him and to make him known. Yeah. Now, after doing all of this, let's get back to the story. Micah then comes across a Levite who left his home in Bethlehem in Judea, looking for better opportunities in life. Judges 17, 7 to 9 says this. There was a young man, a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who was staying within the clan of Judah. The man left the town of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. On his way, he came to Micah's home in the hill country of Ephraim. Where do you come from? Micah asked him. He answered him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to stay wherever I can find a place. 
Micah hears this, realizes that he is a Levite, sees an opportunity, and makes an offer that some might say could not be resisted. Verse 10, stay with me and be my father and priest, and I will give you four ounces of silver a year, along with your clothing and provisions. The Levite accepts the offer, verse 11. Micah ordains him, and then the Levite moves in and assumes his new role and responsibilities, verse 12. Is anyone making any offers this morning? To, no, no, just, you know, I just... Now, at first glance, this could seem legit. Pretty straightforward and above board. Some might even say it's a win-win situation. My son is not a Levite, but he is a Levite. Do you know what I mean? But here's the problem. It's dripping with disobedience and idolatry. Which is what happens when we, redefi when we redefine God and his word. When we redefine God and his word, point number two, we worship idols. Because anything else, anything else that we call God is an idol. If it is not the true living God, we worship idols. Uh, let me give some context here. You see, according to Joshua chapter 21, the Levites had been allocated cities to live in. They had dedicated areas to live and operate in. With regards to income, they received everything from the land that they lived on and from tithes and offerings from their fellow Israelites in the area. You can go read about this in Numbers chapter 18, particularly verse 21. So the first question should have been, why is this Levite wandering outside his allocated area? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you doing here? Secondly, why are you seeking employment? You already have a job. Other questions that I would ask is what authority does Micah have to ordain priests? And then what happened to his son? Just got a demotion there. What on earth is going on here? That, that's the question that we should have. What on earth is going on here? Friends, I believe that's the question that God has when he looks down at his creation. When he looks at the church, I think sometimes he goes, but they have my word, they have, they have the spirit. They, what on earth is going on there? Verses, or verse 13 of chapter 17 in Judges reveals Micah's heart in all of this. We can try explaining most of this away, but the heart always reveals the truth, no matter how ugly it is. Verse 13 of chapter 17 says this, Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, because a Levite has become my priest. So, so Micah, you're trying to earn God's goodness here. You've, you've orchestrated all of this because that, that's how you believe you get God's favor. But friends, all of this is full of religious words, religious things, religious practices, but none of it is governed by God and his word. None of it seeks to honor and glorify him. All of it is done to serve personal interests. A mother to indulge a son, a Levite to secure a better life for himself, and Micah to achieve prosperity by, by adding a smokescreen traditional religious practice to his idolatrous ways. Things look good. They do, they look good. It probably looks nice. Nice lights, nice little stage for the idol. It looks good, but idolatry is idolatry. Idolatry is idolatry. Adding God's name to it doesn't make it clean or kosher. God is not a genie in a bottle, nor is he a wild animal to be tamed. And we're guilty of both. God is like an ATM. It's like, well, God, just you need to give me. I've, I've worked hard, so the money must be in the ATM. You need to just give me. Or, or, or a wild animal. It's like, oh, I want to show you how powerful our God is. When we say move, he moves. When we say stay, he stays. Look how powerful he is. 
And we do this and we cover it up in religious words. Our faith is not a religion. Now, I get it. I get it when people are like, you know, but Oné, it is a religion if you think about it. Okay, cool. I get it. I get it. But what you're saying and what you are doing are two different things. And so let me just go ahead and say it today. Our faith is not a religion because religion is idolatry. Oné, can you really say that? Yes. Religion tries to control God, whereas faith surrenders control to God. Let me, let, me say, let me say that again. Let me say that again. Religion tries to control God. You need to do this. You need to do that. God, only if they've done this, if they've attended this class, if they have this degree, if they've gone to this place. It's, it's, whereas faith surrenders control to God. But maybe you don't like my words, so let me give you Dr. Timothy Keller. He says, religion seeks access to God to get him to do what you want. True faith gives God access to your heart so that he can tell you what he wants. Religion never leads to real prosperity. Rather, it leads to horrific situations. So when we redefine God... Whatever we come up with will always, 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 always be an idol. And idolatrous worship only ever leads to disaster. That's its destination. Along the way, it may take you to some pretty nice places, but its destination is disaster. Which brings me to my third point. Probably my longest one, so get comfortable. When we redefine God... We worship idols. We then descend into chaos and anarchy. Let's go back to the story. Judges chapter 18. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. I mean, literally, anything after that, we should know. Like, it's horrible. We should be able to close the book on that and be like, it was just, it was carnage. But in this case... In those days, there was no king in Israel, and the Danite tribe was looking for territory to occupy. Sound familiar? They send out spies looking for land to inhabit. They come across Micah's house, finding the Levite priest. They ask him to inquire of the Lord on whether their journey will be blessed. Verse 5, it says, Then they said to him, Please inquire of God for us to determine if we have a successful journey. The priest told them, Go in peace. The Lord is watching over the journey you are going on. And the five men left. Friends, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear a prayer. I, 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 they asked, could you inquire? Yeah, 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 go for it. Let's fast forward the story here a little bit. They go and scout the land, and then they, on their way back to give a report to the leadership, they remember, hey, hold on, there was this house with this Levite priest. Uh, let me read from verse 14. The five men who had gone to scout out the land of Laish told their brothers, do you know that there is an effort, household goods, and a carved image and silver idol in this house? Now think about what you should do. So they detoured there and went to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and greeted him. The 600 Danite men were standing by the entrance of the city gate, armed with their weapons of war. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the land went in and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the silver idol, while the priest was standing by the entrance of the city gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. When they entered Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the silver idol, the priest said to them, what are you doing? I would have said it's pretty obvious, but anyway. Verse 19 They told him, be quiet, keep your mouth shut, come with us and be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest for the house of one man or one person or for you to be the priest for a tribe and a family in Israel? So the priest was pleased and took the ephod, household idols, and carved image and went with the people. Shoo. Micah realizes this, right? He comes home and he realizes this. He gets upset, gathers a crowd, and then he goes after these men. They catch up with the Danites who turn around and ask, right? So they, you can imagine there's 600 strong, and there's Micah with a group of people, and they're like, oh, this guy's following us. Are you sh- is, he, is he following us? He's following us. So they turn around, and they say, what's the matter? 
Why have you called these men together and chased after us like this? What do you mean, what's the matter? Micah replied. You've taken away all the gods I have made. Ah, now the truth finally comes out. And my priest, and I have nothing left. The men of Dan said, watch what you say. There are some short-tempered men around here who might get angry and kill you and your family. So the men of Dan continued on their way. When Micah saw that there were too many of them for him to attack, he turned around and went home. So sad for Micah. But friends, that's what happens when you make your own religion with your own gods. They will fail you and then sell themselves over to the highest bidder. Micah now goes back to an empty house. He goes back to an empty life. Micah's pitiful story ends, but the idol's narrative continues. Like a virus, once it takes hold of its host and then it drains every bit of life, it then moves on to continue to destroy. Worse things follow from Micah's idolatry. The Danite continue to lash, conquer it, and then rename it. Sound familiar? Judges 18, 30 to 31, says the Danites set up the carved image for themselves. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, if you were around when we did the Exodus series, that name uh, should be familiar, and his sons were priests for the Danite tribe until the time of exile from the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image that he had made, and it was there as long as the house of God was in Shiloh. Friends, idolatry doesn't just cause chaos for one man and his household. But when the offer was made for a whole tribe, sin takes that opportunity with both hands and inflicts havoc and chaos. This is the horrific potential impact that yours and my idolatry has. Not just one household, but a whole tribe, a whole family. The nameless Levite priest goes from a shrine in a house to Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses. This is the same Moses who wrote the law. Moses' descendants served the shrine for more than 450 years. How bad is idolatry? It's that bad. You think what you are doing is just, just me, just me. You don't realize the potential, generationally, the impact of sin has. Can I remind you again, all of this is at the hands of God's people. Idolatry breeds chaos and anarchy, immorality and darkness, death and despair. That's what it does. Let's keep going. Things just continue to spiral into chaos. The next stories show us what happens when God is absent from our lives. Judges chapter 19. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite, this is now a different one, acquired, interesting choice of words, a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. Really? Verse 2, but she was unfaithful to him, I'm not surprised, and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there for four months. So so what happens is that this Levite then goes after her, after four months, goes after her to try to convince her father to bring her back, that he would come back with her. To make a long story short, he succeeds, and so so he puts her on his donkey and starts the journey back to where he lives. Verse 14, so they continued on their journey, And the sun set as they neared Gibber in Benjamin. Now, that's important. Benjamin is one of the tribes of Israel. Okay? It's important for you to know that. They stopped to go in and spend the night in Gibber. The Levite went in and sat down in the city square, but no one took them into their home to spend the night. That was kind of a common practice of hospitality. If you needed a place to stay, you'd go in the city square, and then someone would come and see you and go, hey, come to my house. Airbnb. At some time, the old man shows up, 
and welcomes them to stay at his house. Verse 20, he tells them, you're welcome at my house. They're settling in for the night when suddenly, verse 22, while they were enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, wicked men of the city surrounded the house and beat on the door. They said to the old man who was the owner of the house, bring up the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. The old man and the Levite, scared, decide to do the most cowardly and horrendous thing ever. I won't get into it, but eventually what they do is they don't want to go and stand up to these wicked men. And so the Levite then offers up his concubine. They then take her and rape her. And then return her back the next morning. The Levite then... The text says he's now about to go home, so zero concern for her. He's about to go home, opens the door, sees his concubine there. She's unconscious. He then decides to cut her up into 12 pieces and send each piece to one of the 12 tribes. Judges chapter 20. All the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out and the community assembled as one body before the Lord of Mizpah. So they all get a piece of this concubine's body and so they get together and they're like, what on earth is going on here? They go to the Levite and they say, tell us, how did this evil act happen? Uh, the Levite explains the whole story, but he conveniently leaves out the part where he sent out his concubine. Verses 5 and 7 of chapter 20. Citizens of Geba came to attack me and surrounded the house at night. They intended to kill me, but they raped my concubine and she died. Then I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout Israel's territory because they have committed a wicked outrage in Israel. And you? Look, all of you are Israelites. Give your judgment and verdict here and now. The coward of of two men then multiplies to an entire leadership of a nation. Naturally, this provokes an outrage, right? So all the men of Israel gathered united against the city. So they all go back to the city where the tribe of Benjamin dwells. They ask that the men who did this be brought forward and be punished. Verse 13, hand over the wicked men in Gibeah so we can put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjamin... Knights would not listen to their fellow Israelites. So a massive fight breaks out. And at first, the army of, of the tribe of Benjamin are winning against all the other tribes. They, they're winning. And, and so now the, the rest of the Israelites are like, what on earth is going on? So they go and seek the Lord. Verse 26, the whole Israelite army went to Bethel, where they wept and sat before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Then the Israelites inquired of the Lord, should we again fight against our brothers or should we stop? The Lord answered, fight, because I will hand them over to you tomorrow. And God did. You can go read verses 29 to 48. They nearly wiped out the entire tribe of Benjamin, their own brothers and sisters. Only 600 men from the tribe of Benjamin managed to escape, and then they made their way to the mountains and hid in the caves. 600. Chapter 21. The Israelites, knowing that these 600 had escaped, take a vow. They say this, none of us will give his daughter to a Benjaminite in marriage. You remember Jephthah? Remember vows and oaths to God? Just be careful. Some time goes by and then their tempers cool off and the Israelites begin to realize what they have done. The tribe of Benjamin has been brought to a state of almost extinction. What now? Remember, they made a vow. We can't give our daughters in marriage. Concerned that these men will die childless, and, and according to this practice and this times here, even worse, maybe even marry foreigners, they come up with some options. If you're wondering, are they good? No, 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 they're not. The first one is, is well, firstly, they go and cry out to the Lord. Let me read verse 2 and 3. Of 21. So the people went to Bethel and, and sat there before God until evening. They wept loudly and bitterly and cried out, Why? Why, Lord God of Israel, has it occurred that one tribe is missing in Israel today? 
Why? What do you mean, why? Did you not almost annihilate them? Judges 21, verse 4 to 25. I'm going to summarize all of this. But basically, they come up with a plan. God doesn't answer them. He's just like, you guys know why. In here, there's talk of them having compassion. No, they had zero compassion. See, it's easy to have compassion to people who are like you. And not to others who think different, look different, maybe even vote different. So they had zero compassion. They say that they did, but they don't. So they come up with one plan and they say, okay, listen, we can't let the tribe of Benjamin be extinct. Let's come up with a really good plan. Are there any tribes that didn't show up when we went to go fight the tribe of Benjamin? And they do a quick roll call and realize that there was one that didn't. And so they go, okay, here's the plan. Let's go tell the tribe, uh, those guys hiding in the mountain, that they can go and literally wipe out that entire tribe, but then just keep all the virgins, and then they can take them as wives. And so they do that, literally. Women, children, everyone, except the virgins. Now, when I read this, I was like, but why? Why would they do that? They're worried about one tribe going extinct. Why wipe out another one? Well, if you, if you read into the text and you do a little bit of um, study, you, you'll realize that, that yes, th this tribe was technically connected to the tribe uh, of the nation of Israel, but they were considered half-breeds. It was a, a region where the tribe of Manasseh had kind of gone and, and assimilated with the Canaanites, and so they were like these half-breeds, as the Bible refers to them. And so they felt like, well, they're not really Israelites. So it's cool. You can do that. Wipe them out. So they do that. They go, they wipe out this entire tribe, take the virgins, but they were short. They only managed to get 400. So then they go, oh, so what are we to do now? Because we're so f full of compassion. They come up with another idea. They go, well, actually, we know that there's another tribe. They have this festival, a yearly festival, where, where they'll send out all the virgins to come to the river, um, and, and there's no men who are present. So what you guys could do is show up there, hide kind of in the bushes, show up, and then when they come, kidnap them, and then surely you'll have enough. I can't make this stuff up. Again, I ask the question, on what grounds would they feel comfortable to do that as the nation of Israel? Well, it was a yearly festival where these virgins would go to the river. There were only three festivals at that time that God's people were to practice. The Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of the Tabernacle. It's none of those three which then should tell us that this is yet again another tribe that has assimilated with one of the foreign nations to the point where they don't even practice the things of God anymore. And so they felt, then we can do away with them. And so they go and they kidnap, they kidnap 200 women. And then we're told in verse 23, and that's what the Benjaminites did, they carried off girls from the dance, wives enough for their number, got away and went home to their inheritance. They rebuilt their towns and settled down. From there, the people of Israel dispersed, each man heading back to his own tribe and clan, each to his own plot of land. It is from this that King Saul comes from. It is from this that Paul the Apostle comes from. That was just for free. Each man heading back to his own tribe and clan, each to his own plot of land. And then the book of Judges ends. Verse 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. When we redefine God and idolatry becomes the norm, we descend into chaos and anarchy. The, the, the world becomes might is right. Where, 
power in the wrong hands corrupts, and absolute power in the wrong hands corrupts absolutely. And in situations like this, the weak, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, and the displaced are taken advantage of. The unseen and those who usually have their voices taken from them are continually made victims. All at the hands of God's people. The Old Testament usually refers to the marginalized quartet, the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. And there we go. That's the end of Judges. Sermon series done. We can now all go home. How depressing is that? I praise God that the book of Judges does not exist by itself in the Bible. There is another book in the Bible written in parallel with the last chapters of Judges. This book is called Ruth. Now you might go, oh, now how do you know it's written in parallel? Well, if you turn over to Ruth and read the first few lines, it says, during the time of the Judges. So does that settle it for everyone? I know some of you are like, oh, but, but. Many of us just need to discover God's word. We're out here trying to discover all these other things when we should be discovering God's word. I wonder how much carnage would have been avoided in the name of God. We're off to discover. No, discover God's word first. This book was written in parallel with the book of Judges. Ironically enough, Ruth is a woman who's not even an Israelite. She was a Moabite who then becomes a widow. So she's a foreign widow who is also poor because she has no husband. The Old Testament quartet, widow, foreigner, orphan, poor, who are marginalized, taken advantage of by the very people of God. You turn the page and we're introduced to a foreigner, a widow, who is poor. I don't have time to get into the book of Ruth, but Ruth was a Moabite. What had happened was an Israelite man and his wife and two sons had kind of left the familiar places where Israel was and went to this place that was close to where the Moabites resided. His two sons then married two Moabite women. The father dies, the sons die. The mom goes, you know what, there's nothing for me here. I'm actually going to go back to my people. And she says to the two women, her now daughter-in-law, you guys can go back to Moab because, I mean, it's going to be rough for me as a widow going back. Hopefully someone will take care of me. One of them goes, she's like, oh, thank goodness, and leaves. Ruth says no. This is where we get the famous words that are said at almost every single wedding. I often wonder if they understand the context from where that comes from. But it's still beautiful. It's still beautiful. Ruth chapter 1, 16 and 17. Listen to Ruth's reply. Don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I, will, I live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. You've got to understand the conditions that Ruth was in. She's going back to a place where she is a foreigner, a widow, and she's poor. But God is gracious. She meets a man named Boaz, a man of loyalty and honor. He then takes her in. Again, I don't have time to get into it, but the point that I want to make is that this woman, a foreigner, widow, poor, Dimension, woman. She trusts God way more than the entire nation of Israel at that point did. Friends, where the book of Judges ends with the words, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. 
the book of Ruth ends with a genealogy. Where Judges ends with death and despair, Ruth ends with birth and hope. Ruth chapter 4, verse 16 to 22. Let me take you to the end. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became a mother to him. The neighbor woman, women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This nation that longed for a king, even though they already had one, God goes, okay, clearly you guys are not going to get it. So through this chaos and this death and this despair, I will bring you a king. The greatest king that has ever lived, King David. Now, we all know that David wasn't perfect. He was great, but he wasn't perfect. He was a adulterous, murderous liar. Let's call it what it is. So even though God gives a king, it's not the king that they truly needed. And so even with that, the story cannot end with Ruth. And so if we fast forward to the book of Matthew, there is another genealogy. I'll read from verse 5 of Matthew 1. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. There she is again. Women, don't ever, ever, ever believe the lie that God does not care about women. You are part and parcel of his sovereign, beautiful plan. Society will say, oh, the church, whatever. Is the church bad? Does it have problems? Yes. And we don't shy away from it because it's all here for generations to read. But God has a plan. Obed fathered Jesse and Jesse fathered King David. Let's fast forward a few generations. Verse 16. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Is there any hope in the horrific? Yes. Yes. It may not feel like it. It may not look like it. But there is hope. There is hope. And for those that's you and me who are on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, we look to the finished work of Christ that he has already come. Our hope has already come. What we hold on to is the fact that he will come again. What is our hope in the horrific? Well, it's not a what, but a who. And his name is Jesus Christ. And friends, he is our living hope. The king that we need. And that is who we look to in times of trial, in times of persecution, in times of despair and death. We look to Jesus Christ, Amen. our living hope. Amen. And that is how the book of Judges ends. I'm going to call the band up and we're going to sing a few songs that, that just kind of remind us of this. This has been a heavy sermon series. It's been weighty. But I love the fact that it ends with an address to the church, to you and I. I think too often we too quickly look to others and say, look what they have done. But the society, but the government, but the, but the, but the, but the state of the nation, we are to hold the nation accountable. But we are first to ask, what is the state of the church? Where are the idols that we have put up? But it's just mine. Yeah, no, but it has the power to impact a generation. This is why I will call our people. Don't judge me. I'm not. You said you're a Christian. You say you believe God in the Bible. Here's what it says. Now let's dismantle those idols. Let's worship the one and true God. And watch this. Our society will change. Our marriages will change. Our children will change. But when we look exactly like the world, nothing will change. It will just spiral into chaos and anarchy. And so we praise Jesus that he came and took it all on.
And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that that you came, you stepped into the messiness of all of this. And it is incredibly messy. That the chaos and the anarchy, the death and the despair that we experience is by our very hands. That our hearts are rotten. And we're in desperate need of a savior. This is why the scripture tells us that you came to turn the hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And so God, would you do it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Help us to see that you are our one and true hope. That you are all that we need. In Jesus' name we pray.